Hi everyone, my name is Simon Kent and I'm a co-founder of Connect Family Law and with me today is Alex Bolin who's a lawyer with Connect Family Law. Welcome Alex. Thanks very much Simon. Uh, Alex is a, a lawyer in our Kelowna office. He was working in Vancouver for the last, or in our Vancouver office for the last few years and has just recently moved to Kelowna. How's that move going Alex? Pretty fantastic. Kelowna is a nice place to be. It is, it is. I'm up there a lot uh, and I'll be visiting you quite frequently. I hope that's true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, today uh, we want to just take a few minutes and um, film an episode called What's Up With That? And as uh, some of our viewers might have uh, uh, seen before, I have gone through uh, both a separation and divorce. I'm now sort of at year 17 uh, of that. Um, Here's to 17 more, right, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've learned a lot, uh, really unfortunate lessons, but learned a lot. And uh, part of my interest in starting Connect Family Law was to uh, make a family law um, better in British Columbia. I'm not sure how uh, well that's going, but we're trying every day, aren't yeah. we, Alex? We can't hurt, right? <laughs> you can't make it worse. There you go. Okay. So I thought what I would do today is just pick two uh, things that came to mind, my mind, while I was going through a separation and divorce, and, uh, and ask Alex to sort of respond to them. So are you ready, Alex? Fire away, Simon. Okay, number one. Alex. If I had my children living at my home for 39% of a, any given week on a regular basis, why do I still have to pay 100% of the child support guidelines money to my ex-wife? It's a good question, Simon. Uh, the basic answer has to do with the way the federal government has chosen to structure child support. So the federal government publishes uh, a law in a series of tables called the Federal Child Support Guidelines. What these do is set out a formula for determining child support. So in most scenarios, or at least most scenarios where one parent has the child the majority of the time, meaning at least 60% of the time, uh, the child support is calculated simply by looking at the income of the person who's paying child support and the number of children. Mm -hmm. You look those two numbers up on a table and you'll get a fixed amount of child support. Uh, the court virtually never departs from that amount. It's pretty much set in stone. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when you have what's called shared parenting, and that's the scenario where each parent has the children at least 40% of the time. 39.5% right. doesn't cut it, it has to be at least 40% of the time. In that scenario, the court has the ability, but is not required to depart from the federal child support guidelines. Okay. So it can do it, but it doesn't have to, but it usually does. When you're in a shared parenting scenario, what the court usually does is figure out how much parent A would pay if they had the kids for full time, and then figure out how much parent B would pay if the other parent had the kids full time, and then set them off. Right. Uh, there are other ways of approaching it, but that's basically the way. Uh, the reason that it kind of works like this is that the government has made a pretty clear decision to favor clarity and certainty over any kind of like nuanced approach to things. So it's really trying to avoid conflict, and by making a really simple, strict set of guidelines, that's what it's trying to do. Mm. It doesn't necessarily mm. succeed because what you end up is in our controversies over that last 0.5% of parenting time, right? Because there's a huge financial incentive for one person to get over the 40% line and for the other person to push them back. So unfortunately, it does tend to lead to a lot of conflict over that last little bit of parenting time. Yeah, so that's why I think it's, uh, it's not working in family law. My personal uh, view on that is there's way too much focus on that 40% level, and that's not in the uh, kid's best interest if one parent is essentially making up reasons why the other parent shouldn't see uh, the children for more than 39.5% uh, of the time. And um, you know, we see that in, in, uh, in practice at Connect, and uh, I may or may not have seen that in my life. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm unable to say at this point. Mm. Um, okay, let's move on then to the second question, which uh, is a question that sort of flows from the first question, and that is, when I was going through my separation and divorce, um, there wasn't a presumption that both parents would have the kids 50% of the time. What's up with that? Yeah, it is true. There is no legal presumption in favor of 50-50 parenting time in British Columbia or in any other province as far as I know. Uh, the only real law that the co uh, court is supposed to be applying uh, is the, a test called the best interest of the children test. So what this means is in every case for every family, the court is supposed to look at all the facts and decide what kind of parenting would be best for the kids. It's not supposed to be bound by a, a, you know, a preference for or against shared parenting. Mm. Uh, 
Um, this is frustrating for a lot of people. People, there is, I think, an increasing societal consensus that something like 50-50 or shared parenting time is in the best interest of children. That's sometimes reflected in what we see from child specialists, at least in British Columbia. And I think the courts, um, although not explicitly, might lean that way as well. But as of right now, there is no legal presumption in favor of 50-50 parenting time. Hmm. Uh, I know that there are some American jurisdictions where there is a presumption in favor of 50-50, and from time to time that's raised in Canada as being uh, something we should move towards. There's been arguments made on both sides. Uh, the argument sort of against it is um, many people think that the court shouldn't be bound uh, or restricted in what it's looking at, that it really should be looking at every case on its own merits. Uh, on the other side, there, you know, having a presumption in favor of 50-50 would give you uh, a little bit more predictability and certainty in terms mm -hmm. of trying to measure what the outcome of your particular case might be. Well, it's also that's especially true when the children are quite young and uh, you, no one can really communicate them with them about what their needs are, or what's going on in, in both homes. And I think not having a presumption of 50-50 leads to increased costs uh, because um, you know, if that presumption existed, it's, it's going to cost a lot uh, um, more, I think, for or a person's going to be a lot less likely to try to go up against that. I think that's almost certainly true. I mean, the trade-off against it is, you know, or at least arguably, is that it will mean a less nuanced approach by the courts. Right. So. Well, uh, and on that point, the, what I find remarkable is that the courts really, except in extreme circumstances, don't uh, interfere with um, a parents' parents' choices when the family is together, when the two parents are together and raising a child. You don't see a judge coming to my uh, kitchen table and uh, criticizing. Uh, what I'm, uh, what decisions I've made about the, the child that day and what they will or, or won't do. But all of a sudden, when you go through divorce, everything's under a microscope. That's definitely true. And you could also compare it to the, the sort of child protection area where the, you know, the government is stepping in where a parent is unfit. Some of the behavior that gets raised in a family law case uh, would never be the subject for child protection concerns, but it still can be uh, a subject of concern or criticism by the court. And that's part of the function of the best interest uh, test. Mm. The test isn't about what is adequate parenting or what is an acceptable level of care for children. It's really about what's best for them. Right. Whether or not the court is fully equipped to deal with that may be a different question, but right. that's what it's intending to do. Well, why don't we uh, leave that for another day? Uh, we'll, we'll make that part two of this video. Right. Is the court adequately... Uh, <laughs> Or are they in a position to make decisions on uh, family law matters? But we'll leave it for another day. All right. So thank you very much for spending some time with us today. I hope you've uh, learned something from this. And I uh, thank you very much, Alex, for being here. My pleasure. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>